Hi there, and welcome back to the channel. Today I have a video for you about a new framework that Apple released with Xcode 16 called Swift Testing. This video is going to be part of uh, what I would probably consider to be a series of videos where I look deeper and deeper into Swift Testing. So if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that right now if you are interested in learning more about Swift Testing. In this video, my main focus will be to introduce the testing framework to you. So we're going to look at a couple things, like how you can add Swift testing to an existing project. We'll explore the syntax of Swift testing, and we'll take a look at two of the most important uh, syntax pieces that exist within Swift testing. Let's just dig right into it and open Xcode so that you can see what we're about to do. So what we're looking at here is an XC test. This XC test is the classic way of writing unit tests in Swift. It uses a setup function, a teardown function, and every test that we write has to be prefixed with the word test. We use XCT assert and other mechanisms to ensure that our code is in the state that we would like. Now, if we want to migrate away from XC test and over to Swift testing, all that we really need to do is add a new file to our testing target. So I can add a new file. I can name that file my first Swift test. And I can start writing Swift tests here. If I already have a testing target, I don't have to do anything special to start using Swift testing. And that will make adopting it really, really easy. All I need to do now is import the testing framework. I can write the at test macro, a function, and sure, um, Swift works. Well, we'll see about that Swift testing, but thanks for the auto completion Xcode. And well, we had a setup and teardown in our uh, XC test. So what we can do is put all of our setup code first, then do an assertion right here. We were just asserting the word true. So we'll do that. We'll use pound expect, which is the new assertion uh, that's part of XC or part of Swift testing, I should say. We'll just assert true. This will always pass. And we can tear down right here. And this already is a valid Swift test. We're not actually testing anything. That's fine, I think. Uh, but what we'll see here is that if I run the test, the project will build, which might take a moment. Build succeeds, we'll start testing, and eventually this test is going to succeed. We didn't have to add a special target for Swift testing. We didn't have to switch our build settings over from XC test to Swift test. All that we had to do is import the testing framework and write our unit test. Note that I didn't have to start my uh, test name with the word test. I could simply write at test func and then start my test. That is really, really useful. And it will really make adopting Swift testing so much easier. I can see Xcode still struggling a little bit to run the tests. I'm not sure why that is. It does that sometimes for me. Uh, we'll just assume that this is going to work completely fine because trust me, it will. I'll go ahead and stop that. So this is nice for a single function, but what if we did want to have something more complicated like this, where we have a shared setup or shared teardown. Well, we can actually just write a class, my Swift test. And then I can go ahead and add code to it. In the initializer, I can actually do my setup. In the dnit for this class, I could actually write my teardown. And I can move my test function in here. The way Swift testing will run my tests is that for every single test function that I add, we're going to get a new instance of my test suite. In Swift testing, we call our classes or structs. We're also fine to use that suites. So this suite is called my Swift test and it has an init and a D in it where I can do setup and teardown if I want. And we have our at test function that will run. We can have multiple of those. So I could add another test like that. 
And this will allow me to run both tests. Let's see if Xcode is willing to cooperate right now. Still loading. Wow. It's a shame that we can't really see this being active right now. But I'll just accept that because it's not been working for me for a little while. Okay, so this will allow me to run two tests. What will happen is we first see setup and then we'll see teardown. Now, let me actually do something so we can run these tests properly. I'm going to switch over to running my tests within VS Code. So I will be back right after the cut with a different code editor and functioning tests. Okay, welcome back. So we're currently in Cursor, which is a version of VS Code that has some AI built in. We're not gonna be looking at any of that actually, uh, but just so you know what software I'm using here. I've added my test that I had in Xcode previously to a Swift package just so that I can actually run it. Um, I somehow didn't get Xcode to work at all, um, weirdly enough, in any event. What I can do now to run my tests right here is to run the Swift test command inside of my package, and this will actually run my tests. And we can see here that my uh, ensure Swift works and ensure Swift works two functions have run. It's pretty nice. Um, we can run all of our tests and we're gonna get new instances of my Swift test. So I can actually write a print here. Uh, print in it is called and I can write a print for D in it is called. If I run my tests again, what we should see is that some prints get executed right here. In it is called, D in it is called, another in it is called, another D in it is called. So you can see that we get multiple instances of my Swift test class. And that's because every single test macro occurrence is going to get its own uh, instance of my Swift test. Now, as I said, my Swift test is a test suite, and you can actually apply a macro to give custom names to your suites, but that is a topic that I would like to look at in another post. In this post, I would like to continue focusing on just the test and the expect macros. So what we can actually do with the test macro is we can give labels to our test names. So currently our test name is just exactly the uh, function name that we're testing, but maybe we want to do something a little bit more interesting and something a little bit more descriptive. So let's move on to testing something that's maybe a little bit more real world. I'm going to go in ahead and make a new file. I'm going to call that exercise view model tests dot swift. And we're going to take this uh, view model that I have right here. Um, it's pretty much empty. I haven't implemented anything yet, but we're just going to add some tests for it. So what I'll do is I'll import testing. I'll testable import my Swift testing posts, and I'm going to make a class exercise view model tests. Now I'm actually already getting some nice uh, completion here from, um, from cursor. I'm gonna go ahead and just use that. It's creating a function test fetch exercises. It's creating my view model and it's trying to fetch exercises. Now, because every test is going to get its own view model anyway, I don't want to have to create it uh, myself every time. So what I'll do instead is make a new instance as an instance property of my test. I know that I'm going to get a new class every time. So I'm going to get a new instance of my view model every time, now, which is quite good. I don't have to uh, duplicate this code everywhere if I have multiple tests. Uh, we're trying to get exercises and we're expecting at least one exercise to be fetched. Um, this test of course won't pass because I'm returning an empty list. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm gonna change this to expect that my exercises are empty, expected uh, the list. Well, we'll just keep this test actually, why not? We're just gonna have a failing test, that's fine. Inside of my test macro, I can give a name to my test. So I can actually pass uh, fetching exercises, uh, test fetching uh, exercises should be not empty. 
If I run my test now, we should be able to see that this test will fail. We're not handling an error. That's because my test function should be async throws. There we go. Uh, int cannot be used as a Boolean. Yep, that makes sense. So I'll actually do this. Expect exercises not empty. Run the tests. There we go. My test suite has failed. And it says test, test fetching exercises should not be empty. Recorded an issue. Expectation failed. Uh, empty is true. Where it should have been false. That's pretty nice. We now have a very human readable name for our test. The expect macro is another macro that I want to take a look at. It is what we use to assert stuff. The expect macro has two different versions. Uh, actually, there's a couple of overloads, but they come down to two versions that I find most interesting to use. One is the Boolean version. That's the one that we're using now. And basically what it expects is that whatever expression you put in it as the first argument returns true. So we can do things like not empty, empty, uh, this equals that, or those kinds of things. It's sort of a, a version of XCT assert where you can put any Boolean expression. The second argument that I always like to pass is a human readable string that tells me what I was trying to assert. So in this case, I expected at least one exercise to be fetched. Let's use another version of the expect macro. So we're gonna write a test. We're actually going to say, I expect that uh, getting a non-empty collection, uh, getting an empty collection, I mean, should return an error. So error. So this is actually going to autocomplete already, saying test fetching exercises should throw an error. I'm actually gonna go ahead and copy that exactly because um, thank you cursor, that is exactly what I'm trying to test. And then we can actually get this. Now, this is not what I want to test. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. I'm going to write a new test. We already have our view model as an instance variable on my test class. So what I can do now is actually do pound expect. And I'm going to use a version of pound expect that allows me to receive a thrown error. And I have to look up the exact syntax. I'm not getting autocomplete here on that, I believe. No, not really. So we're going to look at the documentation for pound expect here. Why not? You'll actually be able to see everything that we get from Apple, which is already quite nice. Apple has pretty good documentation on the expect macro. So we can go here, click the expect, and this is the condition one and we want to have another version, the one that gets an error, testing for errors in Swift code, and then we get expect throats. So we're gonna go ahead and use that. So expect throws, and then you do expect the fetch exercises, no exercise found to be thrown. Uh, then we can pass a label, so expected an error to be thrown. And then we can have an expression here, a closure from which we will try to throw an error. So the third argument is a closure where we do the work that we want to do. In this case, that is trying to fetch exercises. We are expecting that that throws an error. So I'm going to run my test now. And we'll actually see that I need to await this expectation. Run it again. There we go. I now have two failing tests. Uh, one is an error was expected, but none was thrown and an empty array was returned. We can actually fix this one really quickly by making this function always throw, fetch exercises error, no exercises found. Now let's try and run my tests again. And there we go. We now have the, let's see, Test fetching exercises should be empty. Yeah, test fetching exercises should throw an error if no exercises are found, passed. Right, so we can use the expect macro to either expect an error to be thrown or to evaluate that something that we're trying to assert evaluates to true as a Boolean value. 
I think the test macro and the expect macro are the most crucial things to understand if you want to adopt Swift testing. And with just these two tools, you can already start adopting Swift testing in your projects. You can mix and match with XC test, which is really nice because it will make adopting it so much easier. In future videos, I will be digging into other Swift testing features and probably also dig it through the best practices around unit testing a little bit more. So if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button. And hopefully I will see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching.